Good morning. Let's try it one more time. Good morning. Very good. We've got to work on our, our countdowns or a prelude because we don't have that kind of thing to remind us things are starting. But it's good to see you here. It's holiday weekend, so we have people up at camp camping, and we have uh, folks out in the park setting up out there. This would normally be their last Sunday in the park, but they're going to go two more weeks because what happens three weeks from now? New time, new service. So the new schedule and the new service starts the third week of the month, and the third week of the month we start with a time, the, the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock. So let's keep that in the back of our minds as a schedule. Um, also, as we plan towards that, if you would like to be a part of our prayer group, Lois, wave your hand up in the air. Lois is gathering people for a focus of prayer as we move towards this new service. Um, there are so many pieces of this that are coming together, and it's so exciting. Um, if you get a chance when you're done here today and you want to swing out to the park, you'll get a little flavor of some of the things, because really what summer has been, it's been an opportunity for us to run what we might call like rehearsals. Uh, particularly for our music group. Some have wondered uh, about our new music group. It's sounding better and better all the time And uh, as we move towards that kickoff time. Now, kickoff, three weeks from today, kickoff is a football term. And remember, those of you around with us last year, we had some fun on kickoff Sunday. And we're going to do that again this year. We're going to encourage you to come. And if you'd like to wear a jersey of your favorite football team, uh, feel free to do that, your college or pro team. Or um, we, I, you'll hear next week, but I think we'll have some shirts available, those who want to order them with uh, community football shirts that we ordered last year as well. And uh, we'll kind of be having some fun during the service, which will carry that fun following the service on the 21st out into the parking lot here west of the church. And uh, the kids will have blow-ups, there'll be food, there'll be the tailgate party for us to kind of enjoy that way. The food last year was fantastic. There'll be hot dogs roasting, and uh, we'll just uh, have a party. When we get to the 11 o'clock hour, we'd like for as many of you to stay with us through that time. Um, we will be celebrating an abbreviated but helping people to understand something about this new service right out in the parking lot. So our music group will be out there, weather permitting. The food will be out there. Tables will all be set up, and we'll introduce you to some of the people that are going to make the new service start and happen. And the following week, they'll be back in this room starting indoors. But it's going to be a total kind of be out there in the community kind of a Sunday because it really isn't only about us. Is it? You know, ultimately, starting a new service is about folks that haven't been in our church before and are looking for a church and would be open to a church experience. So, as we move into the weeks and the months ahead, it's kind of on us to begin to say to folks, we've got something new. Um, one of the sayings that is starting to catch on around here is one church two services. And that's kind of cool because now you may like the traditional experience and we're going to work hard in continuing that and improving that. But you may know some people that would be more inclined to come to your church if it had that option. So now you'll be able to say, you know, come on, we've got something that'll fit you. Come on and enjoy it. And uh, what a what point of pleasure that is for someone to have a family member who might be inclined to go someplace altogether different, but now they'll have a place here. There are so many other ways that our people in this church can connect at, at meals and at campgrounds and at special gatherings here at the church and other things that we do. Worship is not the only place where we make connections, so we'll look for that in the future. There's going to be a letter that's going to come to you in the mail this week there's going to be a series of questions about this whole new service and, and all the things that are wrapped up in it. And I hope that they answer some of the questions you have. So there'll be a letter and there'll be a sheet both sides with questions and answers. And if you don't see your question there, I want you to call me or I want you to call Shirley. Shirley will be glad to answer questions. And 
we'll bring you up to speed and, and we'll do our very best. And I want you to know the people that are working hard behind the scenes to make this happen really have a heart for the people of North Muskegon and want to make it really work. So be looking forward to that. Also, for the kickoff, just so you see, that Wendy, our secretary, she is the most organized person on the planet. She's got a clipboard here for us. If you're coming, and if you think you might be there, you can sign up for the kind of food you would bring to that tailgate party three weeks from today. Those are the green sheets. Underneath that are blue sheets, and the blue sheets allow us to sign up for tear down or set up or, or for game providers if you want to bring an outdoor game. And then on the back sheet, the white sheet, she has all of us that have already signed up, and she's got us indicated what we said we'd do, so you can check and see if you already signed up and, or if your spouse signed up for you and see what's going on. So I'm going to start these through the congregation so you can kind of keep an eye on that. Are there any other announcements that we have? Shirley? Just for the party. That's right. And just get an idea. You know, the blow-up house for families with young kids, that's fun stuff. And there's food, food, food. We will have more food than you can shake a stick at. So do it. And, you know, if I invite somebody to church and you invite somebody to church, who's more likely to have success? You are. Absolutely. You folks are more likely to have success than I will ever have by making the invitation. I will continue to invite and, and sometimes people actually come when I invite them. And uh, uh, some of you know who you are, but uh, um, I, w I want you to join me in that. That's so cool. A any other announcements that we have this morning? Appreciate your tolerance because there's so much going on for us to hold up. Anything else? Great. Well, let's take a moment and greet each other, and then I'll call you back in just a moment. Well, hi there. <laughs> Did you meet this young man sitting up here in front of you? I just want to make sure you got a chance to meet him. <laughs> She's here, Tracy. <laughs> yes. That's right. I've been reminded there's no meeting this afternoon, so people will know that for our planning process because of the holiday. And there is, we're all done with the, the um, picnics out at the lake for the season, too, so be aware of that. But what a great day. We've got all kinds of other things, and there's a little map in our thing. Come on out and have a picnic with us out at the campgrounds. Let's join together in the call to worship. Stand as you're able and join me with this call to worship. We gather to worship together. Yet all children of the same God. We gather to reconnect with one another. Yet all disciples of one teacher. We gather with different joys and sorrows, different hopes and fears. Amen. And let's join together in this all-time favorite, uh, How Great Thou Art.
Will you please join with me as we read our morning prayer? Loving God, you call us to follow, to turn away from our own selfish interests, and to take up our cross and follow after you. Even if the path is difficult to see or is heading in a direction we would rather not have chosen, forgive us for being so quick to question and so hesitant to follow. Help us to see with the eyes of faith rather than from our own human point of view. Teach us to follow without fear knowing that you are always with us, leading the way. Amen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. It's the time for my young friends to come on down. Come on down, you guys. Any of the kids that are here are welcome to come and join us, or I guess anybody of any age. Let's see if our box is coming down. Do we have our box anywhere? I am not seeing it anywhere. Do you? Oh, there it is. All right. Great. All right, bring it on down. Let's see what it is. You sit right next to me here so I can ask you questions if we need to. Come on down, you guys, and find a place to sit. Any place you want. You can sit right down there. You're almost here. Yes. Okay, let's open up the box and see what's inside. Oh. Did you see what was in there? Oh. What is this? What is this? Were you trying to scare me? You were. Well, you, you probably needed something other than a rubber snake. I, actually, I kind of like real snakes. The biting kind, not so much. But, but I, snakes are kind of cool. I lost one in the house once when I was a little boy. My mother wasn't happy with me. And I know that was her question. And uh, it, she found it, we found it later on, on the tile floor of the bathroom where it was nice and cool along a wall, stretched right along in that corner. And my mother did not relax until we found it. You know, it was like a, a constant search. But here we have a snake. And uh, this snake, you were trying to kind of get a little rise out of me, a little surprise. But it, it didn't quite work this time, but you can keep working on it. Next time, try spiders. Okay? Yeah, this morning I found a real spider out in the shed when we were getting set up, and he's big. If you brought him in to me, that would spook me pretty good, okay? You got a bug catcher? Yeah? Well, I don't know, how many of you, how many of you are afraid of anything? Anybody afraid of anything? Anybody want to tell us what they're afraid of? What are you afraid of? I'm, I'm fine with snakes, but spiders just creep me out. Spiders creep you out, too. Robbie, what are you afraid of? Monsters! Okay. We don't have a microphone turned on, so if we can turn that on, that would help. What, what are you afraid of? Well, water snakes. I heard that they can shoot their poison really far. Ooh, I didn't know that. Wow, that's pretty scary if it were really poison. Anybody else have anything they're afraid of? Anybody afraid of pastors? That's good. I'm glad. Only the kids that didn't come down, they're the ones that are afraid of me, right? Hey, listen, there's, there's something that's said in the Bible, kind of like a command more than any other thing. And it's these words, don't be afraid. Three words, easy, don't be afraid. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, they're in there because guess what? We're afraid of a lot of things. There's things throughout our lives that make us what we call anxious and scared. And so whenever we get afraid, sometimes it causes us to not necessarily make the best choices. You know, when I would see something that would truly frighten me, I might turn and, what, run the other way? Yeah. 
And sometimes that's good because you want to get away from what you need to be, you know, kind of safe from. But there are other times that things that frighten me that really I just need to kind of do what I need to do. Is anybody ever afraid of standing in front of a group and talking? Is anybody out there afraid of that? Kind of, oh, look at that. They say that's one of the biggest fears in life is standing in front of a group and talking. Now, if that happened to me, um, maybe you'd like this. The sermons would get a lot shorter, <laughs> you know? And so I, I could be a little anxious because sometimes they, a little bit of fear means we care and we want to do well with what we're doing. But too much fear could freeze me right up and then I couldn't share a message with everybody on Sunday. So I've got to overcome certain fears in my life in order to do the best things that God wants us to do. So as I see the snake and I'm thinking about fear, I'm thinking about don't, don't be afraid. Do what you need to do in life. And remember, it'll be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Now, I'd probably have trouble if you'd put a spider in there bringing that message. But anyway, we'll put this back, and we'll send it with you, and we'll remember not, not to be afraid. Thank you much for bringing that. Let's have a prayer together, you guys. Lord, we thank you for that reminder that you want us not to live our lives in fear, but you want us to, to be fearless in the face of so many things that can be really hard to face. Watch over these children and watch over us as adults because sometimes we just trade out our fears for new things as we get older. Help us in this, Lord. In your name we pray. And in the name of your Son who taught us all to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, as we deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for coming down.
Thank you, Tracy. That was wonderful. It's time for us to pray. What are the prayers that we brought with us today? Who are we thinking about today? What's going on in our lives? Who are we holding up? Yes. Yes, that's right. Let's remember those around the world and some pretty tense places where our military are right now. Let's keep them in our thoughts. Who else do we hold up? The Larnard family following Sarah's death this last week. What a glorious long life. And uh, so we celebrate her life, and her family does, and they give thanks for all the blessings over a long period of time. The flowers, some of them, along with the slicker flowers that are up on the altar, some of the rest of the flowers in our room are from yesterday's funeral. Who else are we praying for? Yes. Remember Chip, continue to carry him in our prayers. It's great. Who else do we remember? Yes. Yeah, it's been tough, although I have to say, on Friday I sat around the kitchen table over there and Pearl looked so good and she was just kind of chipper and not, I, I don't know which of us was confused, but at least one of us was a little, you know, in our conversation. But um, I was so, it was such a great interchange and time to be together. So I was really encouraged, but I think each day is a different proposition. So let's keep her in our prayers. Who else do we hold up? Yes. Okay, we'll keep Avis in our prayers as you're headed down to Ann Arbor to the hospital there. Others that we're remembering, others that we're holding up. Anybody else? Yes. Right. Let's continue to keep John, your family, in our prayers as, as the weeks go forward. Anybody else that we're remembering today? Others that we hold up? Let's come together then in a time of prayer. Let's start with our prayer song. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Precious Lord, hear the prayers, the prayers that are sometimes buried deep in our hearts, the prayers that sometimes have difficulty finding words, the things that are core to our lives. Hear these prayers. Help us to know that we need not fear, that you love us and accept us just as we are, and you come to the places sometimes that we even hide. You seek us out. And you remind us that, you're, that we are your children. Lord, hear our prayers for your church everywhere. Hear our prayers for your children everywhere. Lord, hear our prayers for this church. In such times of change, help us to understand more clearly the call that you have on our lives together in this place, that we might even more fully 
reach beyond ourselves to a world that is yet to hear your word. Lord, the stillness of this moment, help it break forth into the fullness of our greater understanding of your word as it's read and proclaimed. These prayers, Lord, we hold up in your holy name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll be all set. In Peggy Noonan's book, When Character Was King, she tells about a meeting that happened some time ago. It was between a former president, President George W. Bush, and President Vladimir Putin of Russia. It was their first meeting as world leaders. And George Bush wanted to be sure that they made a connection that they saw beyond the politics of the moment. President Bush brought up a story that he'd read about the Russian leader. Putin's mother, it seems, had given him a Christian cross that he had blessed while he was in Jerusalem. Bush had been touched by this story. Putin told a story in return. He'd taken to wearing that cross. And one day, he'd set it in a house where he was visiting. Strangely, the house had a fire and it burned down. And and all Putin could think about was that cross that was lost in the rubble. And so he came to the remains of that house, and while standing there, he motioned to a worker to come to him so that he could ask him, to look for that cross and give a description. The worker walked over to Putin, stretched out his hand, and showed him the already recovered cross. Putin told President Bush, it was as if it was meant for me to have that cross. Inferring that maybe somewhere deep down inside, he just might believe in a higher power. Mr. Bush said, Mr. Putin, uh, President Putin, 
That's what it's all about. That is the story of the cross. The story of the cross is that God intended it for you and for me. That's the cross. It's found in the midst of the rubble of life. You know, it's, it's no accident. In this morning's scripture, when Jesus talks about bearing a cross, like Mr. Putin, Peter didn't yet understand the cross either. But it's here in Caesarea Philippi, outside of Galilee, in the shadow of ancient Palestine, where, where Caesar was God, that Peter further discovered what it meant that a wandering teacher from Nazareth who was headed for a cross was indeed the very Son of God. There's hardly anywhere in the entire Gospel story where we see the sheer force of Jesus' personality as we see it in this incident, in this story. In one way, this was a moment of crisis. Get behind me, Satan! Whatever the disciples might be thinking, Jesus knew that suffering and death was ahead. As we noted last week, because we're in kind of a series of readings that are connected, it is in this moment that Jesus put all things to the test. He asked his disciples, remember what others were thinking about, who they thought he was, the rumors, the reports. Then came that breathless silence, I'm I'm guessing, and, and he put forth the more pointed question, the personal question, but you, who do you say I am? Peter then professed that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God. But no sooner had Peter made this incredible proclamation that Jesus told him he must tell no one. And and it's a question that's out there. Why do you suppose Jesus would say this? And there's many answers to it, but perhaps, perhaps Jesus felt he had to teach Peter and the others what what Messiah was really all about, because Jesus' role as Messiah stood in stark contrast to the first century Jewish ideas of Messiah. Now, throughout their existence, the the Jews never lost sight of the fact that that they saw themselves as God's chosen people. They always regarded the, the greatest days of their history, those of King David, and they dreamed of a time when when their would arise another king in David's line and make them great in righteousness and power all over again. Now as time went on, it became clearer and clearer that this dreamed of greatness would probably not come about in the normal passage of time and in the normal way, you know, because they came under so many other rulers like Assyrian rule and Babylonian rule and Persian rule and Greek rule and And finally, under Roman rule, it was an awful way for them to exist. And they began to believe that it wasn't likely that someone would simply emerge. More and more, they began to dream of a day when God would intervene in history and unveil more than a prophet, indeed even more than a king, that God would reveal a, a messiah. Instead, they had dreams of a Messiah being ushered in by God in a nationalistic, conquering style in which the perfect reign of God would come about through some kind of great and tumultuous military struggle. This was the predominant Jewish belief. This was the disciples' basic understanding. So the idea that Jesus would be a suffering Messiah was the complete opposite of what everyone was expecting. With this as our backdrop, so to speak, 
Peter starts with the right idea. Jesus, you're the Messiah. But when Jesus explains how this translates into the truth about God's plan, how, how this translates into a, a suffering Savior and not a political military ruler, Peter kind of takes Jesus aside and he scolds him, in a sense. No way will our great Messiah die. This is why Jesus looks at his good friend, his, his star pupil, who just announced Jesus' Messiahship, and he says sharply, get behind me, Satan. The Messiah that Jesus was prepared to be wasn't what they had in mind. And sometimes I wonder how many of us have had something like that experience, in a sense, where at some point during our faith journey, we realize that we, we didn't meet the Messiah we expected either. I dare say there are probably not too many here this morning who have not at one time or another said, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I expected from my Lord and Savior. This isn't where I kind of expected my church to go. I kind of want my church to, to be a bubble where I can exist, and I'm not so interested in bursting the bubble and moving out and trying to bring more people in because sometimes the more people we bring in, the less it is comfortable for me and mine. That's why Jesus, I think, laid it out so plain and simple. If anyone wants to become my follower, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. The more I read, the more I study, the more I try to deepen my relationship with God, the more I realize how frighteningly free we really are. You, you know what I'm saying by that? Sometimes we say we want freedom, we want freedom, but suddenly we realize that freedom isn't always without fear and it isn't always easy. Sometimes it's, it's extremely stressful. I've not been in a parachute before, but you know that moment of free fall when you jump out of the plane? That's got to be pretty scary. But that's, that's free. I know a couple of you have here in the room. The older I get, the more I realize that God has given us some freedoms, sometimes freedoms that do make life a little frightening or a lot frightening. When we freely accept the graceful forgiveness of our Lord and we're welcomed with open arms, we're accepting something more. It's the burden of the cross. Take note of Jesus' first description of what it means to follow him. Deny self. Perhaps you've heard the story of the two brothers who uh, they were coming downstairs for breakfast on a Saturday morning and their mother was cooking the pancakes you remember those mornings that you can already smell it, you're coming down the steps and you're looking for it. You can almost taste it already. The other things are cooking in the background. The... She starts taking those pancakes off the griddle and the boys begin to argue about who gets to eat first. Their mother seizes the teachable moment and says, Now boys, what do you suppose Jesus would say if he were here? And they stop and they kind of look at each other confused and their mother says, Jesus would say, my brother, you may have the first pancake and I'll wait. The older brother looked at his younger brother and said, hey John, you can be Jesus today. <laughs> you know, self-denial isn't always easy. We all have things that we want. We all have goals that, that are ours and, and to do anything else is to vary that plan in some way to help deal with somebody else's deal. But Jesus is clear that when we choose freely to follow him, to follow somebody else, him, 
we, we need to deny ourselves. That's a toughie. This means we can't always do what we want to do, what we want to do. This means that we'll face tough, life-altering decisions that need to be made in the shadow of the cross. They won't always fulfill the desires of our hearts. We're all too often like, like remember Lucy in the old Peanuts cartoon strip. Lucy's swinging in the, on the playground and Charlie Brown is reading to her. It says here, the world revolves around the sun once a year. Lucy stops abruptly on the swing. She says, the world revolves around the sun? Are you sure, Charlie Brown? I thought that it revolved around me. <laughs> and we know that about Lucy, don't we? She lived life that way. It revolved around her. Few of us are, are as candid as Lucy, but believe me, we make the same mistake, all of us, at times, at places throughout our lives. We so easily fall into the secret belief, as if nobody sees it, that it's all about us fulfilling our needs. But Jesus calls us to self-denial. Friends, it is ultimately the only thing that will work because if we're going to be doing God's plan, God is the common denominator. 400 different plans are never going to coordinate. But when we get on the same page with God and we're carefully following that, it can work doesn't mean that we'll be deprived of joy. Not at all. We won't be deprived of happiness. Rather, it means that we'll find fulfillment and joy and happiness through our dedication to the plan that God's placed before us. Denial of self is removing ourselves from the center and placing ourselves in the hand of God all the time. No matter where God and God's hand might lead us, Jesus said, take up the cross and follow. In other words, we've we got to pick it up. It's there for us to pick up. It's not like thrust on us. He didn't say, grab hold of the cross and it'll protect you from all harm. He didn't say, here, let me get that for you. He didn't say, wear the cross as a fashion statement. You know, it's pretty easy for me to put this on and walk in here. He said, pick it up. Again, this means that there's a choice. It's part of that freedom that I mentioned earlier. Jesus had a choice as to whether he was going to bear the cross. I, I suppose he could have said no. It's hard for us to imagine if he had. And we too have a choice whether to pick it up and whether to bear its weight. What does it mean to bear to bear that cross. Let's first consider, just for a couple of moments, what bearing the cross isn't. When, and facing difficult circumstances, people often say, I guess that's just the cross I have to bear. And this isn't the first primary meaning of bearing our cross. When people speak about bearing a cross in this manner, they're often speaking about circumstances and situations that if given the choice, they wouldn't choose. When we suffer from sickness and, and disease and anguish, and it's horrible, it's a terrible misfortune, but it's not quite what's meant here by bearing a cross. Bearing the cross is something that's chosen. We have to step up for this one. We have to show up for work for this one. It's a voluntary form of sacrificial obedience that identifies us completely with Jesus Christ. Bearing our cross isn't making the best of a, a rotten situation or circumstance. It's something we deliberately take up and consciously bear in light of other choices we could have made that could have taken our life in some other direction. We don't do it because we like it. For we'd much rather... Wear a cross, then bear a cross. A lot of us. It's a pretty good fashion statement these days. You probably noticed, you know. Renee Lacoste was 
the world's top tennis player in the 1920s. He won seven major titles, singles titles, during his career, including multiple victories at Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, and the French Open. His friends called him La Crocodile because he was tenacious. He just didn't take anything sitting down. He played hard on the, on the courts. Lacoste accepted the nickname, and indeed, he had a little tiny crocodile embroidered on his tennis blazers when he added it to his line of shirts that he designed, the symbol kind of caught on. And while thousands of people around the world wore alligator shirts, the emblem always had a deeper significance for Lacoste's friends who knew of its original meaning, the cross. It's an emblem of Christianity that holds special meaning for everyone who identifies with Jesus Christ and, and indeed is a follower. Whenever we see a cross, it speaks to us of Christ's tenacity, his determination to do God's will, not his own. To follow one is to emulate what they do. To follow the rabbi, or as it was said in that day, to get the dust, pick up the dust of the rabbi, because as the rabbi walked, he threw dust up. To walk in the steps of the rabbi is to pick up those same priorities, even if it means going to Calvary. The cross is all about making choices. The cross is all about letting go of self. And lastly, the cross is all about following the example as we reach out to others in need. It isn't easy. But cross-bearing draws us closer to Jesus, makes us more like Christ ourselves. For never has a symbol of such pain and torture been resurrected into such a symbol of enduring love and hope and power. It means that our lives will get diverted. Sipping down the highway about a year ago, I was going 75 miles an hour. Sorry about that, whoever's reporting this in. And I saw a woman in front of her car, and I was convinced that she was crying. I thought I saw her makeup all smudged and run. I pulled over, and I was quite a ways down further. I had to back up quite a ways, and... I got out of the car and went back, and indeed I was right. She was crying, just a young woman. And then I looked in and I saw a baby sitting in a seat it's later in the day, and I almost kept going. Well, we were able to make some arrangement. It kind of delayed me from what I was about to do, but oh, how many other times I've just driven right by. How many other times have I missed the opportunity because I've, I've been kind of at the center of my own little universe. But following Jesus is about being Jesus in the world right now. It's about heeding the call to help somebody else in need. It's about joining with others to support outreach and mission and, and evangelism here in this church. It's about being sensitive to those with special needs wherever we find them. It's about inviting a friend to join us in worship or join us in study or prayer or whatever the thing is. Doing all those things and more. Getting us out of our comfort zone out of our preoccupation with ourselves and refocusing us on the call that God has for us to service in the world. Every Saturday night, there's a group of Christians who serve food to the hungry and homeless people in Washington, D.C. 
They serve folks who live within sight of the Capitol and the White House. But they're so often overlooked in our world. You know, people that are desperately poor. They're invisible, often. But before they open the doors to let people come in, the Christian people who are there gather around the food. They hold hands. And Mary Glover, Mary's a person who once was on the outside of that building waiting to get in. And this is what she always prays. Lord, we know you'll be coming through that door tonight. So help us. Help us treat you well. Amen. Those good people understand what it is to bear a cross. There are other things that they could be doing with their time and their money and their energy, but they choose to be serving others in Jesus' name. We got chances to serve in Jesus' name. What are we going to do about it? In Jesus' name. Praise be to God. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward and take our offering. With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And
And now may the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Because of what The Lord has done For us Give thanks And now let us go from this place In the name of the Father And of the Son And of the Holy Spirit Bear a cross Amen.